one of my favourite images. It has shaped how I see myself and live my life. I want you to take a moment to think about what images have influenced how you see your lives. The images that shape our lives are mythic images. Now, sometimes we use the word myth to describe other people's belief, what we call our own belief truth. This is not how I'm using the word. A myth is a conditioning tool that a culture uses to perpetuate itself. I'm going to share with you my idea of how science functions as myth by exploring two mythic images. I'm interested in the function of myth, not in its literal truth. So just as you describe a chair or define a chair as something that you sit in, a myth is defined by the functions in this diagram. It's adapted from the work of Joseph Campbell and summarises how myths shape people and societies. Now myths come to us in stories or in images, and the ones that we embrace provide a context for our lived experience and also sets a limit for our capacity to understand our existence. So the function of myth is not to fool you with something not true, but it's to make you who you are. Now science explains the cosmos to me and many others, sure. But it does much more than this. It helps me to experience awe when I'm camping under stars and I think about the vastness of the universe. Or on top of a dolerite mountain, I, I look back through time with my parents' geologist eyes and see massive glaciers carving out the Tasmanian landscape. These are awesome experiences for me in the true sense of the word. So here, galaxies or geological timescales function as mythic images. This image became quite important to me in my 20s. My, a relationship that I had thought I was going to be in for life had failed and it was fading into the past. My presumed career path was abandoned. My political prejudice were crumbling. My family and my friends were in another state. So I was alone in the wasteland with no apparent reason to be. But it was great. I was living in a shack behind the dunes in Sandy Point in Victoria. I was often surfing in the morning before work. I'd take long walks on the beach with my dog and write about my thoughts and my experiences. So here's an example of how this image, or an experience that I had while thinking about this image. So beyond the excited white water was the rolling swell, where the water stayed still, but the waves passed through. When I looked more closely, there were two waves coming together, one directly from Bass Strait and one rebounding off Cape Lip Trap. And the swell jumped up where the wave forms aligned or it became calmer where they cancelled each other out. I began to see myself as an energy wave, rolling along the beach and through space and time, my dog, an energy wave beside me. All of my atoms, all of my, my, me all of my memories, were encoded in the minute waves that combined to constitute me. Occasionally other people would ripple past, but mostly were left undisturbed. Everywhere I looked there were energy waves. They were washing down from the sun to excite the electrons and leaves and go on through the food webs of all life on Earth. At night they rebounded off the moon on the planets or they travelled to us from distant stars. Shifting tectonic plates set tremors through the Earth and birds and cicadas communed in song. Resonance is a beautiful connection where a note is shared, where waveforms combine without interference. I started to see the complexities of human culture with this image. An idea is turned into language and then moves between us as sound waves. And humanity becomes a dynamic interplay of all these waveforms. Every language is its own ocean. Trends and fashions resonate through the social network and advertising campaigns pulse to sweep us up. And I was part of this continuum. From the thoughts of cavemen to the German philosopher that I was reading, everything that I thought of as myself had come from this ocean of human brainwaves 
and it was just a question of what I resonated with and what I passed on. So the images of waves and particles then became reconciled and what remained of myself, the individual, became a surfer of these waves. I was carving it up, creating my own ripples. And then I'd navigate through, find some calmer water, quiet, still, some rest. The word nirvana is derived from still water. So this imagery is being used for a long time. If I'd use, if I had been, no, sorry. I continue to use this imagery. I try to consciously choose which oceans and which coastlines I find myself on, which waves I catch or avoid, or also those quiet, peaceful places away from the turbulence of my own mind and the day-to-day -day life. Now, if I'd been using the particle imagery to see myself, like grains of sand blowing in the sea breeze, these are bouncing around, I would be occasionally bumping into other people, but mostly an isolated particle. Now, through my professional life and my personal life, I've known many people to suffer from depression. Some have taken their lives. The shocking statistic is one in four of us in Australia and most Western cultures suffer from de depression or another mental illness at some stage of their lives. From the outside, people just drop out of sight from time to time. And this is a warning sign of depression. The sufferers talk of the feeling of isolation. So in this context, the wave imagery, the connectedness describes the mental health, whereas the particle imagery, the separation, describes the illness. Now seeing ourselves as a continuum or as separate entities also finds its way into our political dialogues. Where Desmond Tutu talks of knowing that he or she belongs to a greater whole and is diminished when others are humiliated or diminished. Margaret Thatcher says there is no society, only individuals and families. So here the images of waves or particles are validating two very different social orders. And it's not so much a question of which one is right. In terms of mythic function, it's a question of which of these images helps to create the sort of people and the society that we want to be? The imagery of waves refined my moral compass and I asked myself, am I coming from a perspective of connectedness or separateness? Am I being empathetic or selfish? Now seeing ourselves as part of a continuum as in the wave theory or as separate entities is a lot older than modern scientific thought. In Eastern creation stories, the um, deities divide to become the things of the earth and the prayer of greeting acknowledges the divinity in you. This is all as one. Whereas the Abraham traditions, God, man and nature, are separate. God eats the fruit from the tree of knowledge. No, he doesn't. Man eats the fruit from the tree of knowledge. <laughs> Maybe he did too. And that's the knowledge of good and evil. That's the pairs of opposites. And he's out of the garden and no longer connected in this life. So to be part of God is a truth to be realised in the perspective of the East, but it's heresy in the dominant religions of the West. So again, are we part of a greater whole or are we fundamentally separate entities? We can peel these perspectives beyond thought to feelings too, to love and to fear. Now I use the word love in the sense of connectedness. I love these people, I love this place, I love this idea, or I love this product. Love as connection to what is part of us. Fear is a growl in the dark in an unknown place. It's about the other. It's about what we are not. Fear is only possible in an atomized existence when your focus is on the other. So fear very much belongs to the particle imagery. Now it's selfie to see that crocodile or predator lurking in the dark as something to be afraid of, something to remain separate from, as opposed to two waveforms becoming one. 
So, you know, fear, like the particle imagery, it does have its place. From 2004, I taught in a Yongul community of Yakala for two years, and my connection there still remains. The imagery of waves, when I was adopted into the Yongul family, was always close. The waves moving through the connections. As I found myself in, the, in their society, found my identity in their society. The kinship system is called Guruto, and it's an explicit fabric linking people, places, plants, animals, everything. From the moment when a baby is born, they learn first their relationship names before they're learning the names of individuals. And so that was my experience there also. First learning my relationship to people before I'd learn the um, names of the individuals. So again, it's a social fabric over the individual, that balance. So my, Yakala challenged my moral compass of acting out of connection over separateness. My Yongle family really looked after me, but as the only person in the family with a troopie that could take us hunting or take us to the shops, the demands were pretty frequent. You know, and this was really different to my experience growing up in a nuclear family with far fewer, fa far fewer relationships to maintain. And so as a Westerner in that situation, it's very easy to find that boundary between yourself and the other. The resolution that I've continued to find, it's like the surfer. What is good for all of us isn't necessarily what one person happens to want at a particular time. Sometimes we choose the wave that we catch, and sometimes there is no choice. We may not consider how mythic images are shaping how our thoughts and our experiences in our existence go. But they're still providing the structure for how we conceptualise our world. Religions have long understood the importance of surrounding us with mythic images to reinforce these structures. And science, as the basis of my reality, also does this. Our information-rich world is awash with images that shape our experiences and shape our thoughts. But how often do we think about them and how important they are in making us who we are? So I'll leave you with this question. What images are shaping you? What are your mythic images? And where do our children find theirs?